Welcome back. This is Isaiah 52 and 53, and we're going to start in Acts, chapter 8. So let's turn to Acts 8 together. There was once an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official, and he was on a trip to Jerusalem, and he was in his chariot on his way home, and he happened to be reading the book of Isaiah. And we're going to pick it up in verse, let's see here, 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. <coughs> Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? This is Acts chapter 8, verse 31. And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation for his life is removed from the earth. And this is the question the eunuch asked uh, Philip, verse 34. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Who's he talking about? Of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Let's go back to Isaiah 52. So, this scripture has... Has, has had an evangelistic function for a long time. However, until Jesus came, I think the Ethiopian's question was the standard question. Who is this talking about? <coughs> is he talking about himself? Is he talking about somebody else? Who in history fulfilled this? Or is this someone yet to come? And uh, once, you, once you read the life of Jesus in, in his biographies, uh, the Gospels, you, you, the, the, the lengthiest part of all the Gospels is the part at the end where it talks about his suffering and his death. And then his resurrection gets a, a little bit, but it, it seems like it's very heavy on these other things. And it really just lines up so beautifully with what we're about to read. So we're going to start in uh, 52.13. And this is one complete poem or song. It starts in 52.13 and it ends in 53.12. It's broken up into five stanzas of three verses each. And so I don't know anyone uh, who set this to music other than Handel in uh, Handel's Messiah. <laughs> this is sort of the, uh, one of the main chunks of Bible that he uses in his oratorio. But... Uh, you know, maybe somebody could come up with, with a, a version of this that we could sing. That would be nice, huh? Um, since it's already that kind of a format. But let's take it right from the top. 52.13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Uh, this is the happiest part of the song. <laughs> um, if you remember, I think it was 49 started on this incredibly high note as well, right? So, he, he will prosper, he will be high, he will be lifted up <coughs> and greatly exalted. In your notes I wrote, The servant of Yahweh will prosper, but not yet. He has a task to complete that cannot be accomplished if he does not humble himself and submit himself entirely to the will of his God, even if that ends him in suffering to the point of death. Then, once he has gone through the fiery trials that await him, he will be greatly exalted. But we start with the promise in view, and so did Jesus. We'll get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 2, I think it is, where it talks about, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the suffering, right? And so we start with the joy set before him in verse 13, that he's going to be high and lifted up. Of course, we know that's talking about resurrection and also ascension, that he's exalted to the right hand of God. Uh, Verse 14, just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. 
So we go from exalted to so beaten up that he's worse than anybody else. <laughs> kind of shocking, right? Uh, a very, very fast switch here. Um, my people, as you, if you're reading the NASB, is italicized, and it's, it's not in the text there. <coughs> um, people puzzle over what to do with the you, um, and uh, I'm not really sure what to do with it either. But I take it as a reference to the servant, uh, and then we just have a, a switch of a person uh, going from the second person to the third person. Um, but um, another translation puts it, the New English translation, just as many were horrified by the sight of you, he was so disfigured he no longer looked like a man. The servant of Yahweh will be beaten severely, though not as punishment for disobedience. For what reason is he, the servant beaten? You know, we're not told yet. We just said that people are astonished, they're shocked, they're looking at him, and they're saying his appearance is, is just so beaten. Verse 15, Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. So this is another one of these places where there's some confusion about the word sprinkle. Uh, and so Hebrew experts, they say that sprinkle should be translated startle as the New American Bible, the New English Translation, the Septuagint, the RSV, NRSV, New Jerusalem Bible, and the Jewish Publication Society. They all go with startle. Um, and, uh, you know, it, w w it, it's hard to read it as sprinkle. He will sprinkle many nations. You know, what does that mean? Um, and then it's a parallel construction construction, right? So the first line is, he will sprinkle many nations. The second line is, kings will shut their mouths on account of him. Um, so if he, if he startles them, then it makes sense that they would shut their mouths because they're, you know, startled or whatever. Um, <coughs> but let's get, let's get the point, regardless if, if it's sprinkle or startle. Um, the, uh, let's see here. The point is, the human is so disfigured, so marred, so irreversibly damaged that his sight is shocking to the eye. Indeed, the nations reel at him and the kings shut their mouths. And, and there, there is a sort of strangeness, a sort of um, paradoxical character to the situation because uh, what had not been told them, they will see. What they do not understand, or what they, do not, what they had not heard, they will understand. So there's something going on here that is surprising that... Doesn't, it's not just a surface understanding of what's going on. And, and, and we'll get to this, but the standard inter interpretation people would have of a criminal on a cross is that he did something bad and he's being punished, just like you would have if you read in the newspaper so-and-so got the electric chair. You wouldn't think, oh, poor guy, probably got you know, beaten up for the wrong reason. No, you would think this person probably did something really bad. Um, and so most people looking at Jesus, you know, mocked him and made fun of him when they walked by because that's what you do to the criminals being crucified. They're, the, you know, they're getting what they deserve. Um, and so what they had not been told them, they will see. What they had not heard, they will understand. So there, there's uh, some, some hidden wisdom going on here. 53.1, this is where Romans was quoting from. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Um, who would even believe this message? I've got a, a quote here from a friend of mine, Pastor Steve Taylor. He says, Nothing is more outrageous than to hear that God's sinless Son would die on behalf of all people. This story is the ultimate stumbling block for those who are looking for a Messiah who would come as a conquering king. Um, and so... This is also what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians. I have it in your notes. We preach Christ crucified. You know, e e even if those two words both start with a k sound, <laughs> they're, they're, they're as uh, uh, repelling to each other as you can possibly get in the original context of the first century. The idea of Christ is somebody that uh, sits on the throne of David, who rules on behalf of God, who is the conquering hero. The idea of crucified is a criminal, is a, is, a, is a loser, a nobody, somebody who either you know, did something really bad or got on the wrong side of 
the, the wheels of justice in the Roman Empire and got crushed by the machine. You know, I mean, we're not, these two words are like, like in the first century. To us, you know, that Christ would be crucified is obvious. But to them, it's very unusual. And so this is what the apostle says. To the Jews, a stumbling block. The idea that Christ was, would be crucified is a stumbling block. You're walking along, you trip over something, right? That's a stumbling block. And uh, to the Gentiles, <coughs> foolishness. To the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, so the, uh, the, the non-Jews would hear the story and just be like, well, that's just silly. That's uh, foolish. That's, uh... And the Jews hearing the story would be like, well, that's, uh, you know, that's just crazy. That's out there, man. You know, it's just be a stumbling block. But in the wisdom of God, contained within that, uh, and, and he readily recognizes elsewhere in 1 Corinthians that it's through the foolishness of preaching that God has ordained that people would be saved. That through this sort of like subversive wisdom that on the surface look foolish, but once you realize what's really going on here, that, that God is defeating evil without using the same evil to defeat it, but you know, through this, this, this cross, that it is really the wisdom of God. Verse 2, For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. Some of this stuff is just fantastic. It's just uh, really insightful to Jesus' nature. And like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. You ever see one of those movies where Jesus is a foot taller than everyone else and has like blonde hair? <laughs> Not realistic, right? <laughs> This man, in your notes, this man did not grow up in the palaces of royalty with a silver spoon in his mouth. He is not to be compared to those great cedars of Lebanon, but rather to a mere shoot off a branch, something that would normally be considered common and even expendable. He's not like the oaks of Bashan, flourishing in a forest of hospitable conditions, but rather he is a root surrounded by the hostility of parched ground, one who was not prideful but fully acquainted with the struggle for survival. Even so, he grew up before him, God, which is to say that he lived his whole life in the presence and under the watchful eye of the Almighty. Yet his appearance was common, easily confused with other men of his time. In such a way, Jesus was able to slip into the crowds. You remember the times that they tried to, grasp, to grab him or arrest him or stone him and he would slip away? Well, if you... If you look like everybody else, you can do that. But if you, know, you have a halo ho hovering over your, your head at all times, you're going to be easy to spot, right? <laughs> so indistinct were his features that Judas, while betraying him, found it necessary to kiss him as a sign to his adversaries that he was the one they wanted. He is not like the stars of our age, the stars of our age who would be disqualified up front unless they have artificially whitened teeth, a fashionable haircut, a lean figure, and a beauty that instantly grabs the eye. That's not, that's not this hero. He's, he's one of us. He's common. He's not in the minuscule minority of pretty people, but one who fits in with the majority. I just love that about Jesus. That he, that he as it says here, grew up like a tender shoot like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was just a normal man, the way he looked. You know? I love that. I tell you, sometimes they get their teeth so white on the commercials that I, I fear to run into one of these people in real life. Like it, especially if it's, if it's a sunny day, it might reflect off there and blind me. I don't know. But um, Jesus is real. He's genuine. He's somebody that you could talk to. He's not, and he's not just a facade. You know? Verse 3, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. He's not the winner of American Idol, or any other such popularity contest. Rather, he is the one who would receive the least number of votes. 
because he is despised and forsaken. Unlike uh, another ruler, Herod Antipas, who constantly courted Rome's approval while seeking after the love of the people, this one does not woo the crowds. Jesus isn't out there giving stump speeches about why he's great. He, he just didn't do that. That wasn't his approach. He is a man of sorrows, acquainted not with the sumptuous meals of the sagging dinner table of the wealthy, but with grief. One who saw him was more likely to pass him over than esteem him to be someone great. Even his own people did not receive him. In John 1.1, 1, 1, scripture we've read before, it says, he came to his, or 1.11, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. He, he, he was despised, he was rejected, he was a man of sorrows, he was acquainted with grief. You know, he was somebody who knew, you, you ever talk to somebody and, and you, you've just gone through something really tough and you're, you're talking to somebody and it seems like they um, have a very easy life and, and, and you feel like saying, you know, you, you can't relate to what, I'm, what I've gone through. You know, I, I might as well not even, you know, go through this with you because you just have no, no idea what it's like to go through this, whatever it is. You know, he does. He was acquainted with grief. You know what I mean? Um, the, the sort of pain you feel when you're uh, the, the last pick in gym class, you know, the, the, you know, he was despised. He was rejected by, by his peers. Verse 4. Surely our griefs, or sicknesses, he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He began doing this in his ministry, the part where he carries our grief and our sicknesses and sorrows. Matthew uh, cites this verse in chapter 8 and says, Thus it was fulfilled, in the context of him healing people. Uh, but he completed this work also in his crucifixion, the work of bearing our griefs, carrying our sorrows. He is not doing this for his own benefit. He is doing this for us. Notice how many times it says our in verses 4 and 5. Let's read it through. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our Iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. You know, this is, this is really something that's done for others. And I love how personal it is. It's our, you know, when we read through it. It really is so beautiful. Our infirmities, our pain, our grief, our sorrows, he carries on his shoulders. Even so... We do not recognize that this is what is happening. Instead, what do people do? Instead of gratitude, we look at the pitiful figure and say, surely he is cursed by God. What must he have done to deserve this? You remember the scripture that Paul quotes in Galatians from Deuteronomy where it says, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. You know, People really considered him to be cursed by God for ending up in such a situation. And so in the, in the incredible wisdom of God, the subversive wisdom of God, what happens? Well, he becomes a curse for us to deliver us from the curse of the law. In Galatians, you know, it's just ma magnificent. But nobody gets that at first. All the while, we do not realize that it is our own pain written across his face. And, you know, sometimes people, they, they like to argue, well, it was the Jews that killed Christ. And, or they want to say, no, it was the Italians. The, the Romans were the ones that killed Christ. Um, and uh, there, there, there was a lot of controversy when Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ came out and so on. And uh, I think the proper way to read it is that it was, it was us. It was our, you know, if we were there, we would be in the crowd, and we would be shouting, crucify him. You know what I mean? Uh, and I, I think that's the perspective to take it from because... Um, if you take it from that perspective, then I think we're being the most realistic about who we are. <laughs> and the, these, are the, these are the people that, are, that are in, eventually end up repenting anyhow. Verse 5, 
or, or wait, let me talk about the cross in the first century back in your notes. The meaning of the cross in the first century of Judea was much different than it is today when we wear crosses around our necks and use it for other decorative purposes. Prior to Jesus' crucifixion, the cross was regarded as a horrifying sight, a public display of Rome's power over life and death. So the cross already had a theological meaning, had a political meaning. The theological meaning was that Caesar is Lord. The political meaning and the theological meaning were united together. It was, it was, it was a, a signal to everyone. It was a deterrent to anyone who dared buck the ultimate authority of Caesar. It was designed to be extremely painful and humiliating. The person was typically hung naked. Even the word crux, the Latin word for cross, could not be uttered at the dinner table because it called to mind a disgusting image, just like you wouldn't use the word vomit at the dinner table. The word cross was a bad word. Verse 5, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. He was pierced through, crushed because of the sin of others. It was not for any crime of his own that he was beaten. He was at once innocent, but also entered into solidarity with us. He endured the chastening that makes us well. It was for our benefit that he endured blow after blow from the scourge. Yet somehow, by this process, he was not merely wounded, but we were also healed. There's that, again, that paradoxical way that God is working through this suffering of Christ to heal everyone else. Really something. Let's read that verse again. Verse 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. That's something, isn't it? Really, it really takes a minute to grasp. You know, the uh, archaeologists disputed that Jesus, that they actually used nails on Jesus because they said the standard way to crucify people, <coughs> it was more common to use ropes on the hands and on the feet. And then they found a, uh, a, a grave not too long ago of a dead criminal who has a long Hebrew name that I won't try to pronounce. But I can show you the reference if you're interested in it. And what happened with this poor guy is he was crucified and they, they drove the nail through his, uh, his feet and it hit a knot in the wood. And so it, it, it bent, the nail bent. So when they went to remove the nail, they, they couldn't, uh, after he was dead, they couldn't get it out. And so they ended up burying him with a piece of the wood and the because usually the nail you would use again. And so they found this guy, and it's very clear that he was crucified, and he's still got the nail in his feet with the piece of wood on the other side of it. Um, and and it, it, it's just unbelievable because this is 700 years before that. You know what I mean? That he's, he's being predicted that it's going to be like this, these, these things, pierced through for our transgression, you know, scourging and so on. Very uh, historically accurate. Verse 6. All of us, <coughs> like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. We have not kept the law of God as we should have. We have not served God with all our hearts, all our mind, all our strength, all our being, all the time. We have gone astray. Each and every one of us has turned to our own way. We have defiled ourselves with our willing rebellion, our pride, our wicked heart that cries out, no one will rule over me. I can do this on my own. I don't need anyone to tell me what to do. That's, what, that's what's in our hearts. Through such efforts, we have shaken our fists in the face of our Creator and separated ourselves from Him. In an effort to break free, we find ourselves slaves to sin and addicted to self-destruction, a way of life that ends in our own defeat. But God does not leave us in such a pathetic state of affairs. Amen. Just when we were crushing under the weight of our own selfish sins, God, in an act of outrageous mercy, lifted the mountain of guilt and allowed it to fall on His servant. Yahweh, in His astounding love for us, has caused his, this iniquity, which we thought we could bear, 
to fall on the shoulders of the one who truly can bear it. He's the hero. He can bear it. We can't. Let's read the verse again. Verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Step one, we have to recognize that we've gone astray. (laughs) And then we can get to step two, which is realizing that God has made a way of salvation through Christ, right? Uh, It's been my experience that step one is the hard part (laughs) because we really think we're something. We really think we can bear it. No, no, I don't, no, I, I He's not going to take my place. I'll, I'll take my place. Uh, you know, if I did something wrong, I'll be responsible for it. You don't want to stand on the day of judgment before the wrath of God and say, I'll take it. <laughs> you can't take it. We can't take it. He can take it. We can't. And that's, that's step one, right? Verse 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. What happens when you're getting treated unjustly? Oh yeah, we get going, don't we? Did you hear what happened to me? They charged me $5 more for this. We can't let it go. I'm I'm in a situation like this right now. I've got a... a, uh, Internet host provider that, uh, that I just use for my, myself, and uh, they have a plan where it's, it's $5 a month, uh, which is not bad, you know, it's a pretty good price. Um, and then, uh, you know, they, they don't tell you this, but if you go over a certain amount of downloads per month, they start charging you secretly. And they only give you a bill once every six months. So I've had these guys for years, for years. And every six months, I get a bill for $30, $30, because it's $5 a month, right? I got a bill for $173 instead of $30, right? I'm talking about it. <laughs> My wife's heard all about it. I've called the complaint center, or I, I called them up, and you know, I gave the lady an earful, and then she said, well, I can either uh, transfer you to the technical department uh, and they can confirm whether or not you really did use that much or I can give you my uh, boss's voicemail. I'm like, I, I'm, I, give me the voicemail, I guess. He never calls me back, right? So, so I call, I want to lay a complaint in and she's like, I'm sorry, our, uh, you, we have no phone number for complaints. You have to email them. <laughs> There's no email address either. You know? <laughs> Then I try to call him up yesterday. I get the message, our, our center is in Philadelphia, and we are closed because of the hurricane. Oh, <laughs> right? This is, this is a minor injustice. I, I, I'm still not 100% sure I can't get my $140 back that they very sneakily charged me. Um, but, and here's, oh, here's the kicker. For, for one more dollar a month, it's unlimited. It's unlimited downloads, right? And so they don't tell you once you've gone over it that, you know, they wait the full six months. And, but, you know, they, the, the nice thing to do would be to say, hey, look, we, so, we see you've, you know, you use it more. Maybe you should go up the dollar or two a month. No, no, $140. All right, so it's, 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 it's still fresh. It's raw. Back to the notes. The usual cries of complaint and murmurs of injustice that one would expect did not pass by his lips. He's different. He was oppressed and afflicted by the consequences of others' actions, yet he would not open his mouth. He did not avenge himself, nor did he seek from God that his vengeance would fall on his enemies. If there's somebody that was ever qualified to do that, it was Jesus you know, one, one little prayer, and, you know, there's a, I, I bet the, there was a whole bunch of angels up there sort of like in the ready position, <laughs> right? Like sprinters on the block, ready to take off. Just, just, just let me at them, right? And he doesn't open his mouth. 
He kept his mouth closed, staggering the world with his silence. When brought before kings, he would not even seek to defend himself. He knew what awaited him, yet he did not seize upon a private moment with the willing procurator to secure for himself an escape route from the plan of his God. This is from Matthew 27, verses 12 to 14. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear what many things the, they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was shocked. He was quite amazed. It's just nothing added up with the Jesus incident as far as Pilate was concerned. But Jesus is not a masochist. He did not enjoy pain. He volunteered. He's a volunteer who knows what must be done. He had already begged his father to find another way, any other way to achieve the necessary result. Remember that? If it be possible, let this cup pass for me. He prayed it three times. I've got the three verses there from Matthew 26. What was the answer? No. There is not another way. This was the only way. He had to drink the cup to the dregs if the Father's will would be done. Verse 7 again. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. I, f I found that uh, a bit difficult to follow. So I've got two other versions uh, in your notes here. <coughs> this is the New American Bible. Not the New American Standard Bible, but just the New American Bible. No S in this one. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny when he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people? This is the New English translation. He was led away after an unjust trial. But who even cared? Indeed, he was cut off from the land of the living because of the rebellion of his own people. He was wounded. He was led away after a mock trial fit either for someone so guilty as to need <coughs> as to not need an authentic trial or else someone so difficult to prove guilty that he must be rushed through the motions of justice quickly and under the cover of night lest others be made aware of his innocence so either they thought he was so guilty there was no point in really doing a real trial or they they knew he was innocent and so they had to do this mock trial to get through i i, I think to some degree both i think they were convinced he was guilty because uh, he really did think he was the Messiah. And at the same time, they couldn't find any solid uh, accusers, because in, in Judaism, you have to have two witnesses to agree. And that was very difficult. The worst they could get him on was that he said he would um, build the temple if it got destroyed or something. You know, I mean, just totally pathetic, flimsy charge, right? Um, he was led away after a mock trial. And who was there to advocate for Jesus? Who sounded the alarm of injustice loud and clear? Even his own disciples had left him, fleeing for fear of their own arrest. Even Peter, the stalwart hero, did not stand up for him, but denied him over and again until he ran off into the night sobbing and ashamed of his cowardice. His suffering, his wounds, his torture brought his body beyond the point of remedy, with many stripes upon his back and nails through his hands and feet, he continued past the point of no return. With all the violence of a world drunk with pride and blinded by its own rage, he, the servant of Yahweh, absorbed it all. We'll come back to 1 Peter 2, but verse 23 says, While being reviled, which Reverend Courtright also mentioned, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. He was brought to the brink of the pit and stared deeply in it. Then he whispered, it is finished. He bowed his head, exhaling his last breath. Verse 8 again. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Verse 9. His grave 
was assigned with the wicked men, and he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He had not broken the law of God, nor was he even deceitful, for he had no reason to be deceptive. He had done no violence, never had he assaulted others, though he had received the fiercest attack. This is the NET. They intended to bury him with criminals, but he ended up in a rich man's tomb. So there's some debate on the Hebrew translation there. Since he had done nothing wrong, it was only fitting that Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin, took the body of Jesus, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. Again, this is written 700 years before it happens, that he was counted as a, a criminal, and that <coughs> he would be with the rich man in his death. Just staggering. Verse 10, but Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. I, I want to draw your attention to the word if there. That if tells me that he's volunteering, that there's a condition here. It's not all written in the stars or something like that, you know, he has a choice. He's not just a puppet. He's not just somebody in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he's not somebody that God is forcing to do this. He decided to do it. In the notes, Yahweh was pleased to crush him, not because God enjoyed the process. It's not because God likes it when his only begotten son is in pain. Of course God doesn't enjoy that. But he's pleased to crush him, but because of the incalculable good that would result from his voluntary action. This is no case of divine child abuse, but the horrifying result of our own sin meeting the wrath of a holy God, hungry for redemption, not blood. Furthermore, it is essential to stress that this servant of Yahweh volunteers for his work. I think that really changes everything. If he volunteers, then he, then he is a hero who is throwing somebody else out of the way of the, the bus and, and taking the hit themselves, right? But, it, but if it's just, you know, his destiny and it was all laid out and he had no choice in the matter, then, you know, it's, a, it's just like a robot, you know? Um, so I think it's critical to realize that if there, the language is conditional, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, which indicates he had a choice. We are not observing a case where someone is being forced to be the scapegoat against his will. He was not someone who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus did not merely fall victim to the hostile pol political paranoia of a vicious Roman procurator, nor did he unwittingly fall into the trap of conspiring jealous religious leaders. He was not crucified just because men hated him. It was the will of the Father to crush him, to put him to grief. This was the plan from the beginning. You remember in Genesis 3.15, um, his... <coughs> You will uh, bruise your heel, or your, the seed of the woman will uh, crush his head, but he will bruise his heel uh, of the serpent. This is Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, listen to the words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So the idea is that it was God's plan. It was predetermined, right? Because Isaiah 53 is 700 years before the fact, right? But he still chose it. He still chose it on his own. And I have no idea what the answer is to the question of what if he didn't choose it, you know, so you can't ask me that question because I don't know the answer. But you can ask, you know, you can think about it. He will be the guilt offering, or his life is given as an offering for sin, is how the NAB puts it. Calls to mind the sacrificial system of the law under which Jesus lived and died. In order to expiate for the sins of the people, an animal will be killed and offered to God on the altar. Similarly, Jesus, through his work on the cross, nullified the guilt of the people and redeemed them with his blood. I love Revelation 5, 9, and 10 because it, it it's like one of these purpose statements about 
Jesus' death. It tells us, gives us a little insight into one of the main reasons why he went through with it. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you <coughs> to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So Jesus' blood purchased people. And I love how international, international it is because, like, pluralism, multiculturalism, diversity, these are all virtues in our present day that were totally not virtues at the time of the writing of Revelation, which tells me that this book is about 2,000 years ahead of its time, right? Um, where you've got people from every tribe, nation, and language that are being redeemed by this Jew so that they can reign on the earth as kings and priests. You know, I mean, it's really a, a, a beautiful connective between the fact that Jesus died for our sins and to what end, so that we could rule with him in the kingdom of God. These two things really go together. Even though he offered his life, literally soul, as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. This indicates he will not stay dead, for the dead know nothing, nor are they capable of observing what is done under the sun. In order for him to see his offspring, his seed, he must somehow live again. Right? I mean, he dies in verse 7. Or sorry, verse 8, he dies, cut off from the land of the living. Verse 9, he's buried, right? And now in verse 10, it says, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Well, if you're dead, how are you going to see your offspring? It doesn't make any sense unless there is a resurrection, right? And so I'm not saying that this very clearly spells out the resurrection, but I'm saying resurrection is the only way that I can think to make sense of verse 10. Again, you have the wisdom of God sort of setting these things up early on here. Um, in order for him to see his offspring, his seed must live again. And when this occurs, the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. He will carry out the desires of God. One day the will of God will be done on earth as in heaven. Verse 11. <coughs> as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. When the work is completed, the servant will look back upon what he has done, difficult though it was, and be satisfied in it, because by his suffering, many have been justified or declared righteous, and their iniquities, which they could not atone for, have been lifted from them. This is Romans 6. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. And so the idea is that as a result of the anguish of his soul, verse 11, he will see it and be satisfied. He'll look back on it and be like, I'm satisfied. You know, it's like, you know, you go for a long run, right, Priscilla? And, you, and, you, and you, you, get, you get to your, the, the distance that you set out to do. And the whole time it was torture. But then you finally get there and you say, I'm, I'm satisfied now. I, you know, I did what I set out to do. This is like a lot bigger than that. <laughs> I mean, the work of Christ in his passion was just unbelievable, right? But he looks back on it and says, I'm satisfied. Why? Because my servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. I mean, how many times are we going to say it here? He's going to bear the sin of many. He's doing this on behalf of others. He's not in it for himself. He's not doing it so that he can get something out of it. He's doing it for us. He was numbered with the transgressors, transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Interceded for the transgressors. He prayed for his enemies. He will be given the ultimate inheritance because he poured out his soul to death Though not a transgressor, 
was numbered among them. He will be exalted. His disciples fulfilled the role of transgressors by bringing two swords. If you look at Luke 22, this is quoted there. And he was regarded as such while on the cross, since the men on either side were transgressors. So I, I would say that that has probably a double fulfillment there. Now let's talk about the results of the, the cross and the work of the suffering servant. Although it is undeniably true that the ser servant's suffering was for our sake, I said it over and over again, for us, freeing us from sin and the power of the devil and even the old covenant. It's also true that the cross is our example to follow. I'll close in 1 Peter 2, 19-25. You see, what happens here is the, uh, the, for the forces of darkness and evil and Satan and demons and wicked people, you know, they, they threw at this beloved Son of God everything they had, right? I mean, we're talking verbal abuse, gross mis uh, misinformation and injustice. We're talking about teaming up on somebody, right? You ever been teamed up upon, you know, where you don't, even have a, a voice, right? All that, you know, and then we get into the physical aspects that we don't need to describe in detail, but, you know, he was just beaten and beaten and beaten in, in many different ways and ridiculed and, you know, beaten on and said, prophesy to me with uh, blindfolded and so on, and then crucified in this very horrible, uh, shameful, humiliating way. I mean, they really threw everything they had at him. And how, do, how does God defeat evil through Christ, he, uh, Christ absorbs it. He's like a magnet that, or a sponge that, so, that uh, soaks it in, right? And it, and it doesn't come out of his mouth. It doesn't come out, it doesn't spill over into his actions, right? What happens to us is if something bad happens to us, then it spills over in, in our other speaking or our actions, you know? If I find out that you know, Greg Schubert's been, been talking bad about me, you know, then I'm, you know, when I see him, I'll probably give him the cold shoulder or something. You know, it'll spill out into my, I can't, I can't absorb it and, and not retaliate, at least not easily, right? Christ absorbs it all, and, and then he died, and that's how God chose to defeat evil. It's really something. And then you have the resurrection. And the resurrection flips everything upside down. Now the cross is no longer the symbol of Caesar is Lord. S mess with Caesar and you're dead. It's no longer that anymore. You, you, nobody even knows that. I, I just said that and you probably were like, yeah, whatever, Sean. You know, because everybody knows the cross is a symbol of God's love for humanity. So, so uh, thoroughly has the this, this symbol of torture become a symbol of, of love because of the resurrection, because God did not leave him in Hades, in the grave. He raised him from the dead. So that is God's uh, conquering of uh, evil through Christ and, and the conquering of the grave. And this, this whole idea of, wow, his death really must have been for something because God has vindicated him. God has decisively done for Christ what he's done for no one else. And he would not have done that if he wasn't his guy, you know. So the resurrection really is what gives, gives the crucifixion all its meaning. There's lots of crucified people throughout history, you know. But the resurrection is what makes it all ha have so much sense. Um, and then also that it's an example for us. 1 Peter 2.19, for this finds favor. For if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. So this is talking to us as Christians. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept him trusting himself to him who judges righteously. 
And He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin. So that we might die to sin. He did it so that we could die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us the courage, give us the stamina, give us the ability through the power of your Spirit to live like Christ, to suffer unjustly when it, when it happens and, and to do so in a way that conforms to what we have seen and what, in what your Son has done. We thank you for this suffering servant song that we've, we've read. And although it's so painful to, to consider, um, we know that it was, it was necessary and we know that it was done out of love for us. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.